in your eyes. The same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. An hour of wolves and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West! You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. What do you think it's all about, Richard? I mean, the, the suggestion is that it's more politics, an issue politically as opposed to legally. I had several people on the broadcast earlier today who said this letter, they point out, was sent to Congress. It was not sent to Robert Mueller's team. It didn't have a lot of uh, legal discussion of charges that were going to be draw, uh, brought against Mueller's team. So as you look at this in totality, what is this all about? Well, it's a bunch of BS and baloney. I mean, uh, what's going on here is that the uh, members of Congress uh, want to carry uh, President Trump's water here and attacking uh, Robert Mueller. But it's not going to work because Robert Mueller is a Republican. Uh, he was appointed by a Republican deputy attorney general. Eisenstein was appointed by President mm -hmm. Trump. And uh, what is involved here is collaboration with the Russians, a foreign adversary, uh, in connection with the 2016 election. That's what's being investigated. Uh, the members of Congress who continue to uh, make this type of fuss are making themselves look vulnerable uh, to this type of inquiry. Uh, there are serious questions about uh, Russian oligarchs and others close to Putin who may have contributed to the uh, congressional campaigns. And if we have a spe second special counsel, that's what a second special counsel ought to be looking into. Robert Mueller doesn't have time to deal with all the hundreds of congressional campaigns going out there and what the Russians were trying to do. But these members of Congress are clearly very defensive about Robert Mueller. None of these claims about Mueller have any basis. Uh, those emails were already the possession of the United States government. They're transition team emails. Our tax dollars are used to fund the transition team. Uh, obviously, Robert Mueller can get a hold of those. I I've never seen uh, such specious arguments uh, about attorney-client privilege or executive privilege or any of the rest of it. And I want to emphasize, I think these members of Congress are going to be in serious trouble in the 2018 elections if they keep behaving this way. Mm. And uh, I've been a Republican for 30 years, but we could lose both houses of Congress very quickly because right now they just look like they're fronting for Vladimir Putin and uh, whoever collaborated with the Russians. It is Tuesday, December 19th of 2017, and you are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your executive chef and chef du cuisine, Justice Putnam, and uh, it is Tuesday, so our daily special, of course, is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, 
a melange of news and import for your enjoyment. Thank you for joining us. Um, well, 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 Richard Painter. Uh, Richard Painter is uh, essentially uh, uh, expressing a concern that uh, I, ooh, I, I have expressed uh, considerably over the past uh, year. And uh, that is that uh, when you're following the rubles, they might take you into some, um, hmm, how shall we put it, unexpected places. Or they may be expected. It certainly, things certainly make more sense now when you consider the decades of the destruction of American institutions. Hmm. Because this didn't start with Trump, right? Right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we need to see what kind of money has been laundered through ALEC. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Well, regardless, uh, the old Shakespearean quote, I doth think you protesteth too much. The vitriol in which these GOP members have been going after the FBI. I mean, I thought the Republicans were the law and order party and all the rest of us hippies uh, were basically the targets of the FBI. And now... All of us hippies are the law and order crowd, <sighs> which also uh, begs the issue that I brought up since I was a kid. These conservatives don't really believe in any of their BS. <laughs> they don't believe in it. They'll turn on a dime to stay in power, to get in power and to stay in power. And what are we experiencing right now? I mean, you had Grover Norquist on, uh, I think, CNN and arguing that Republicans never consider deficits to be an issue. What? Grover Norquist, his whole life is predicated upon getting rid of the deficit. Of course, he was just saying that apparently all those years. And you could see the example of it because when has a Republican administration or Congress ever concerned themselves with deficits when they're in power? That is when the deficits go through the roof. And maybe, maybe in Grover Norquist's mind, that's uh, one way of shrinking government somehow to the size where you can drown it in a bathtub. Who says that? Russian assets? Hmm. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Well, let's uh, take a look at <laughs> what we will be attending to today. Uh, big news day every day and uh, had to had to decide on what we were going to uh, serve up today in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And uh, so but these are the issues that we will be attending to today. Uh, we'll discuss the outrage parents expressed after the Holocaust was left off the South Carolina social studies teaching curriculum. Was that an oversight? Huh, I don't know. And uh, let's see, Trump considered rescinding Neil Gorsuch's SCOTUS nomination because he wasn't loyal enough to have Fuhrer. Now, I was under the impression that the Supreme Court was a co-equal branch of government, not a branch that shows fealty to the executive. Hmm. Well, I suppose if you learned your civics from the FSB agent who was giving you the, you know, the crash course on American government and civics, you might think that, that. Supreme Court justices obviously have to take a, uh, uh, an oath of loyalty to the executive. But I know for a fact in, uh, that in the few civics classes that are still taught in the schools, uh, that's just not true. Uh, okay. And uh, speaking of needing to uh, learn the basics, it looks like a leaked memo has revealed that Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has had to be tutored on the basic diplomacy of allies should be treated better 
than adversaries. That's draining the swamp, folks. Yes, it is. Well, after the break, of course, uh, we break down the front cafe and then we move everything back to the chef's table for a little intimate examination of the European Union silence on Austria's pro-Europe far-right coalition government. Yes. In Austria, hmm, and eight ancient Roman shipwrecks are discovered off the coast of the Greek island of Naxos. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. All right, now that we're all settled in here in the front cafe, why don't we uh, start off with this first course by Beatrice Dupuis out of Newsweek. A revision to South Carolina's State Social Studies Guide left out any mention of the Holocaust stunning parents. School officials attempting to calm the public said the genocide, during which more than 6 million Jewish people were killed, will be referenced in the final version of the standards. They said it was omitted from the original draft because department officials wanted to, quote, broaden education standards, end quote. And nothing broadens education standards the most than, well, ignoring the Holocaust. Okay. Eileen Chepanek, a board member of the Selden K. Smith Foundation for Holocaust Education, a South Carolina organization, by the way, said the omission was cause for serious concern in the community. Whether it was an oversight, it means our work is still imperative, she said. We have survivors in our community. They are getting up into their 90s. We must bear witness. The state school's chief, Molly Spearman, said that the Holocaust will be explicitly named in the final version of the text, set to be adopted next school year. South Carolina has a long history of supporting the remembrance of the Holocaust and its victims, she said. The history and its teachings are supported by tremendous resources that are available to students and educators. Yeah, whatever they say they have tremendous resources, they don't mean in the classroom. You know, you can go to the library or I don't know, maybe maybe there's like a CD that you can get at the record store. Remember the record store? Oh, you don't have one of those? Hmm. Well, there are tremendous resources available. You just won't be learning about it in the classroom. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. A group of educators and education advocates from the community revised the state standards, which is what led to the confusion. State officials said the document would be reviewed and edited by the department before it is approved, and the state plans to implement the new standards in 2020, by which time most people will forget that the Holocaust is forgotten. The community can offer feedback on the revised document until February. Spearman uh, said she encourages all parents and citizens to review the standards closely. Okay. A spokesman for the state's Department of Education, Ryan Brown, said the omission led to concerns that because the Holocaust was not expressly mentioned, it would not be taught. Huh. Well, of course, this is the same state that banned To Kill a Mockingbird because, uh, well, it was divisive to the community. Indeed, that's exactly what it was supposed to be, fella. And it's usually fellas. Usually. I don't know. Okay. Um, Being the son of a professional historian, we used to discuss at great length the, the outrage over... That, you know, like the black cowboy, for instance, not being taught in junior and junior high and high school. Because if it's not taught, then it never happened. I mean, how many black cowboys did you see until Silverado? That's how it works. Well, we're way past the black cowboy here. Six million Jews. How many gypsies, et cetera, et cetera. How many, how many homosexuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep, never happened. Because uh, if you mention the Holocaust 
it probably uh, is is a bias against those who don't believe in the Holocaust. And we need to broaden education standards, don't you know? Now, this next course uh, that we're serving up here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy in the Front Cafe for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, by the way, uh, uh, brings to mind a much larger issue that uh, normally or in normal times, this story would be such an astoundingly large story. Uh, it, it would command the airwaves, print media etc., cetera, etc., cetera. because it is, well, barely known, barely comprehended, barely cared about, shows the normalcy, normalcy, in which the odd has taken, pl- has taken precedent, the corrupt has taken precedent, and we've become inured to it, To the point we are numb. Information overload. That is part of a strategy. And I'm not just making it up. All right. This is uh, by Noor Al-Sabai out of Raw Story. Donald Trump privately discussed his frustrations with Neil Gorsuch, his Supreme Court nominee, earlier this year amid worries that he wasn't loyal enough to the president. As the Washington Post reported last night, Trump was upset that then-nominee Gorsuch had pointedly distanced himself from the president in a private February meeting with Senator Richard Blumenthal, a Democrat from Connecticut, claiming he was, quote, worried that Gorsuch would not be loyal, end quote. I... I, uh... I don't think this shows a great amount of disrespect when I mention this is not the behavior of a president. It is, though, the behavior of a mafia don. Just saying. According to several sources familiar with the conversation, Trump floated the idea of rescinding Gorsuch's nomination over the slight, though it's unclear his explosion was mere venting or was discussed as a genuine prospect. I go by the uh, axiom that uh, they will show you what they are and who they are. Okay. Nevertheless, that's at the time, some in the White House and on Capitol Hill feared that Gorsuch's confirmation, which had been shaping up to be one of the clearest triumphs of Trump's tumultuous young presidency, was on the verge of going awry. The penultimate achievement of his presidency is being able to install a Supreme Court nominee that was only there because for the previous year of the past administration of the black president, the Supreme Court nomination was held up by the GOP Congress. And I keep saying, follow the rubles. Doesn't it all make sense now? Gorsuch's uh, confirmation and short tenure in the Supreme Court has been touted by the president as one of his greatest achievements. I was able to install a Supreme Court justice into a seat that was stolen. Now, I suppose somebody who considers that to be a great achievement is usually not a presidential uh, personage. But uh, Mafia Dons, they love that stuff. I mean, I was able to achieve something from something stolen. That's the greatest thing the Mafia Don can do. According to 11 sources within the White House or familiar with the discussion, Trump was especially upset by what he viewed as Gorsuch's insufficient gratitude for a lifetime appointment to the nation's highest court. Shortly after his interview with Blumenthal, Gorsuch sent the president a handwritten note thanking him. Your address to Congress was magnificent, Gorsuch wrote to the president in a note obtained by the Post. And you were so kind to recognize Mrs. Scalia. Remember the justice 
and mentioned me, my teenage daughters were cheering the TV, Gorsuch summed up. Upon receiving the note, the president was placated. What a... God, this guy is such a small-minded, egotistical buffoon. As head of legislative affairs, our team was in charge of his nomination, and never did I view his nomination in jeopardy, nor did the president ever suggest to me that he wanted to pull him. Mark Short, the White House's director of legislative affairs and assistant to the president, told the Post. The process obviously caused frustration, but that frustration was compounded by the fact that Gorsuch had sent him a personal letter that he never received. What? As Bloomberg's Stephen Dennis noted on Twitter after the Post published their story, Trump's concerns that Gorsuch would not be loyal to him are misplaced, given that judges and other federal law enforcement officials take oaths to uphold the Constitution rather than the presidency. And it's all reminiscent, of course, of Trump's uh, request that former FBI Director James Comey swear loyalty to him. And when Comey didn't, he was fired. The Constitution is a threat to this guy. Anyone who has pledged loyalty to the Constitution is obviously disloyal to the authoritarian. And they must be purged. And it looks like they are. This last course here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy in the Front Cafe um, also uh, begs a larger issue, and that is, who is the sharpest tool in the toolbox? On the one hand, you have a uh, installed president who, my joke is that he learned American civics uh, in the crash course that the FSB gave at the Kremlin when they were training their assets. And then you have a secretary of state who apparently doesn't know the basics of diplomacy and has to be tutored on that as well. So they both say Tillerson says he's smarter than, than Trump. Trump says he's smarter than Tillerson. If these are the sharpest tools in the toolbox... I say we pretty much need a new toolbox. This is by Brad Reed out of Raw Story. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, whose tenure at Foggy Bottom has resulted in plummeting morale among America's diplomats, has had to be tutored in the very basics of diplomacy. A leaked memo shown to Politico reveals that Tillerson earlier this year got a crash course in Diplomacy 101, and it included instructing America's top diplomat on the importance of treating allies better than adversarial countries. Well, maybe Tillerson has can't tell the difference between allies and adversarial countries because it's all about the money. The adversarial countries aren't so adversarial when they're willing to give you money. Ah, allies should be treated differently and better than adversaries, read the memo, which was cobbled together by Tillerson policy aide Brian Hook. Otherwise, we end up with more adversaries and fewer allies. I think that this is not... E I, when I was in school, this wasn't taught in junior high because it was taught in third grade. Whew. Hook's memo also, but let me just interrupt here real quick. I'm an old guy, all right? So uh, I, I, I'm, am I supposed to feel guilty that I reaped the benefits of uh, great free education? No, I'm not. Okay. Hook's memo also suggested that Tillerson should only lecture adversarial countries on their human rights abuses and should also go easy on friendly human rights abusers such as Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the Philippines. Well, he does give an explanation on why one would do that. But really, if you're a diplomat, you would press them maybe in private. On the other hand... 
I saw and heard one Hillary Clinton take our allies to task on their human rights abuses. And is Egypt and Saudi Arabia really our allies? Really? I mean, yes, there's been a long-term alliance predicated upon capital. Okay, summing up, Hook uh, continues writing, uh, explaining why you would treat Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the Philippines better than, you know, adversarial countries on human rights, is that we should consider human rights as an important issue in regard to U.S. relations with China, Russia, and North Korea, and Iran, he wrote. And this is not only because of moral concern for practices inside those countries, it is also because pressing those regimes on human rights is one way to impose costs, apply counterpressure, and regain the initiative from them strategically. I don't think that was comprehended by Tillerson whatsoever. I think that went right over his head. But I would also say that, um, you know, if you hit your your enemies on human rights, a democratic state, a representative a democratic republic, I believe, as an old school romantic, would also uh, express... Maybe not privately. Maybe it would be public at the podium that everyone has to concern themselves with human rights. And if that doesn't go over well in that country, well, we have ways of pressuring them, right? Because it's one way to impose costs, apply counterpressure, and regain the initiative from them strategically. Well, uh, <laughs> that pretty much brings us to the point where we better go to a break. And, of course, we'll uh, break down the front cafe, put it back into its uh, camouflage of a sedate uh, but refined uh, cookbook store. And we'll move everything back to the chef's table where <laughs> the speakeasy's back at the chef's, ta- chef's table. Got the kitchen and uh, the spirits, as they say. And we'll carry on our conversation there. Okay, so you are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind. A new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When it snows this winter, make sure you clear more than your driveway. Before you hit the road and before you get in the driver's seat, check to be sure that your vehicle's tailpipe is clear of snow. If the tailpipe is blocked, carbon monoxide, an odorless, colorless, and deadly gas produced by your engine can build up quickly inside your vehicle, poisoning anyone inside. To learn more, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. That's Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Tuesday, December 19th, 2017. I'm Mark Belanche. Labor organizations around the world commemorated International Migrants Day on December 18th to fight for the rights of migrant workers. There are about 232 million migrants in the world. One of the labor organizations which used the day to renew its efforts to support migrants was the European Trade Union Confederation. The ETUC represents some 45 million workers in 39 countries. Liena Carr is the ETUC's confederation. Federal Secretary. She released a video on International Migrants Day. On this special occasion, I renew our commitment to support undocumented workers' rights. 
The EDUC expresses solidarity with all migrants and is thankful to Europeans who, saving lives at sea, keep our common values high. It is time for our politicians to take real action to stop the inhumane treatment of migrants by criminals in refugee camps. We need to work to go together to create opportunities for migrant workers to become part of our labour markets and societies. Labour inclusion and access to rights is key to ensuring dignity for those who settle and work in Europe. Recruiting and organising migrant workers, whether documented or undocumented, is vital for the rights and conditions of all working people. Only a united workers' movement that protects everyone and fights for everyone will be strong enough to succeed. Fighting the use of offshore tax havens is one of Labour's most important battles because the lost tax revenue could pay for decent public services and wages. So imagine the surprise of people at the Canadian Labour Congress this week when they found out that the pension funds of 25 million workers in the country have used tax havens. The news that tax havens have been used by the pension funds came from an analysis of the parish Paradise Papers, which showed how corporations and other organizations are using countries such as Bermuda to avoid paying taxes. The problem in this case is not that the pension funds are avoiding taxes in Canada. In Canada, pension funds do not pay taxes on their investment income. The funds are using the tax havens to avoid paying taxes in the countries where they are making investments. This further legitimizes the use of tax havens, which are stealing billions of dollars in tax revenue from countries all around the world. Hassan Youssef is the president of the Canadian Labour Congress, the COC. It's really an affront to the members who expect the pension plan investment arm to operate in an ethical way. This is not the reality, and politicians should be absolutely outraged that this is happening. The Canadian pension funds involved in the use of offshore tax havens include the National Pension Plan, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, and the Public Sector Pension Investment Board. Labour organizations are doing their best to publicize the misuse of tax havens. One of those organizations is Public Services International. The PSI represents 20 million workers who are members of 700 unions in 154 countries. It has been conducting a campaign to help more people understand that global regulations and investment rules, plus corporate greed, are allowing billions to be stolen from economically poor countries all over the world. As part of its global campaign for tax justice, the PSI has released a report about corporations and how they steal money from the poor. You can find out more about the PSI campaign for tax justice by visiting its website at www.world-psi.org. And that's it. International labor news you can use. Radio Labor's newscasts are available on its website, iTunes, mobile phones, union websites, and community radio stations. Follow us on Twitter, at Radio Labor. I'm Mark Belanger. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. Corporations and their academic cohorts keep trying to make an industrial tomato to rival Mother Nature's product. And they keep failing. They might consider this instead, the Rutgers 250. It's a revived version of the classic hybrid tomato bred in 1934 by Rutgers University and Campbell Soup. Its excellent flavor and texture made the Rutgers variety the tomato of choice for years eventually accounting for 60% of all tomatoes grown commercially in the U.S. But it fell out of favor in the 1960s when big industrial growers in California and Florida switched to hard and tasteless tomatoes bred to withstand the crushing power of the harvesting machines they had begun using. The Rutgers variety soon disappeared from grocery bins and was forgotten until 2009. 
That year, with the good food movement mushrooming and with consumers demanding that supermarkets sell truly flavorful tomatoes, plant breeders discovered that Campbell still had genetic material from the parent plants used 75 years earlier to develop the original Rutgers variety. So, for eight years, they've been working with it again, using crossbreeding techniques that go back to Latin America's pre-Columbian natives. Slowly but surely, they brought back the Rutgers and its natural flavor, glowingly described as, quote, the very taste of summer. The resurrected Rutgers is not hard enough to be machine harvested and shipped across country, which is one of its major virtues. The fact that this tomato must be grown and marketed regionally is one step toward a decentralized, deindustrialized, and better food economy. This is Jim Hightower saying, instead of trying to squeeze nature into a high-tech corporate model, this tomato represents an understanding that our food system can and should cooperate with nature and foster the growth of regional economies. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. From UN headquarters in New York, this is your World in Two Minutes. I'm your host, Luke Vargas, for Talk Media News. The Russian government is praising American law enforcement cooperation for averting a potential terror attack in St. Petersburg. According to Russia's presidential spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, U.S. intelligence tipped off Russia about a planned Islamic State attack scheduled for December 16th. After the U.S. tip, Russian police arrested seven individuals and recovered a cache of explosives. Peskov characterized the U.S. tip as, quote, an ideal example of cooperation that he said saved many lives. A new railroad could soon connect Brazil, Bolivia, and Peru to Pacific Ocean ports after the German and Swiss governments agreed to back the project. The 2,300-mile-long freight line had been eyed as a way of boosting South American exports to China, but had been delayed by high costs and demand for technical expertise, until now. By utilizing the railroad, Brazilian exports could reach China three weeks faster than sailing them through the Panama Canal. According to agreements signed over the weekend, construction on the Bioceanico Railroad would begin in 2019 with a scheduled completion date in 2025. And IKEA is in the headlines this week, but not for its build-it-yourself furniture or Swedish meatballs. The European Union's competition chief is probing two tax bills from the Dutch government that may have given sweetheart tax status to IKEA, but not to other companies. EU regulators have been targeting those sorts of deals in recent years, saying they distort the market in favor of multinational corporations. The EU previously found a sweetheart deal between Ireland and Apple Computers let the American company avoid paying more than $10 billion in taxes that other companies would have had to pay. For more global news headlines, visit TalkMediaNews.com. Thank you for uh, uh, accompanying us back to the chef's table. We've cleaned up and broken down the front cafe, so it looks like simply just West Coast Cookbook, but you are now in the speakeasy at the chef's table for, well, really a more in-depth and intimate discussion. Uh, before we get started, uh, uh, let's get uh, the weather out of the way. Here along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, we are currently under both a winter storm warning and a winter weather advisory. Oh my. Currently 32 degrees. Uh, we're expected to go to about 48 today. We'll see. Uh, rain will be occurring in just a few hours. Uh, 
I'm supposed to get quite a bit. And uh, right now, winds are out of the northeast, negligible, less than three miles per hour. But they will be shifting from the west to southwest at 10 to 20 miles per hour when the rain starts to come. And then tonight, uh, we have a projected low of 32, maybe colder, but we are looking at rain and snow showers. Some people would call that sleet or icy rain or rainy ice. I don't want to drive in it. But tomorrow, I have to go for my physical therapy for this knee replacement. Yeah, they work you out before so you can get worked out when it's done. Isn't that something? But we're looking at snow showers tomorrow. Uh, should dry out for a few days, and then we're looking at some more rain uh, the beginning of the week. So hmm, maybe we will have snow on the ground for Christmas. Uh, the nights will be cold enough if there's precipitation uh, lurking in the uh, heavens above. Okay, uh, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased, and these people live around the world. London is 44 and clear. Paris is 42 and overcast. Uh, Rome is 46 and clear under a wind advisory uh, in which uh, their infrastructure could be shut down. That happens. Uh, Kiev is 29 degrees with snow. Kabul is 53 with haze. Hong Kong, 59 degrees and clear. Tokyo, 42 degrees and clear. Sydney, Australia is 85 and partly cloudy because they're in their summer, you know. They're in another total hemisphere. Wow, 81 and partly cloudy. And San Francisco, California is 46 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 50 degrees Fahrenheit and overcast. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. And these people live around the world. All right. So we are now uh, settled in pretty much here at the chef's table. And I'll bring you out this first course. But let me... Uh, open up with just a little tidbit that I want to mention uh, about uh, during the break, uh, the one news clip about uh, Russia thanking the United States uh, CIA for helping them uh, foil a terrorist attack. Um, I, that is good, but uh, it isn't, you know, uh, the statement isn't uh, uh, placed in a vacuum. There's uh, something attendant here, and uh, we need to be aware of it. So uh, uh, who, who, who benefits on our side from that news, considering that uh, there's a counter-espionage and criminal investigation going on? Hmm? Because this is not the uh, first time that Putin has thanked some uh, foreign power for their intelligence services helping him out. Uh, yeah, yeah. Countries that uh, others might consider to be uh, the victims of Putin uh, flexing. All right. OK, I had to get that out of the way. So let me uh, start up with this uh, first course here at the uh, at the chef's table. And it is out of the EU Observer by Esther Zalen. The European Commission was muted yesterday after the swearing in of the new Austrian coalition government, which includes a far right party and whose program collides with existing EU policies on migration. 31 year old Sebastian Kurtz the youngest chancellor in the country's history, I believe he's 32, will meet with European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker on Tuesday evening, that's today, on his first official visit to Brussels as Premier. Uh, I believe, actually, he should be getting ready for that, uh, that meeting as we speak uh, for the time changes. Hmm. Okay, Kurtz, leader of the center-right Austrian People's Party, or the OVP, will also meet European Council Chief Donald Tusk. 
The President will establish the Commission line tomorrow after meeting with Prime Minister Kurtz. A spokesman for the Commission told reporters on Monday when quizzed over concerns on the far-right shift in Vienna. We have an interlocutor, which is the Austrian government, he added. In a you know, particularly patronizing Germanic accent. By yours truly, too. Kurtz OVP struck a coalition deal with the far-right Freedom Party, or the FPO, whose leader, Heinz Christian, I'm sorry, Heinz Christian Strasch, became deputy PM. The coalition has taken a hard line on asylum seekers. They want friendlier relations with Russia, don't they all? Every single right-wing government and personage wants uh, friendlier relations with Russia because they're the great white hope. And aim to cut wages and welfare to scare off migrants. I like that. Yet the government agreement also states the country's commitment to the European Union. Wow. It's almost like Austria is trying to be neutral in all of this. Kurtz, along with his ministers, were sworn in yesterday as thousands of people protested on the streets of Vienna with placards saying, Nazis out and refugees welcome. The commission's response to concerns over the presence of a far-right party in the ruling coalition Currently, the only EU government in which a far-right party secured such a powerful position is in stark contrast to the EU's reaction 17 years ago when the FPO first entered a coalition government. Back in 2000, European governments imposed diplomatic sanctions on Austria for FPO's presence in the government, even though the EU executive's reaction was lukewarm. A key difference is that Kurtz's government emphasizes that it is pro-EU. European Union first. With Austria taking over the rotating presidency of the Union in the second half of next year. Hence, the quick visit of the young premier to Brussels today. Unlike the resurgent far-right in the Netherlands, Germany, and France, the Austrian coalition program is not attacking Brussels, is not calling for rolling back EU integration, or for stopping, let alone dismantling the Eurozone. However, the FPO's European political family is cheering its ascent into government and interprets it as a win for their populist ideas, despite the pro-EU rhetoric by the FPO. Well, you know, you got to take off the, uh, you know, the stormtrooper uniform, put on a really nice uh, dapper suit, and say the things that you need to say just to get done the things that you really want done. Okay, dapper. Far right. French leader Marine Le Pen said on Sunday at a conference of far-right forces in Prague that it was very good news for Europe for a right-wing populist party like the Freedom Party to enter government in the EU. That's right. They're looking at it as, as a win. We've got to step in. We've got one, one foot in the door. No, no, we have even more than a foot in the door because this young premier gets to take over the presidency of the EU for a term. Very nice. Well, 17 years ago, a far-right party's political win and government role was unprecedented in post-war Europe. Now far-right parties enjoy support from a large part of the electorate, and even when they are not part of the government, they often influence its policies. Well, this is rather frightening. It almost seems like this far-right resurgence is worldwide. Dutch politician Gert Wilders' Freedom Party became the second largest in the Netherlands. Le Pen was in a runoff for the presidency, and the alternative at Germany entered the Bundestag for the first time in the UK. The UK Independence Party helped force 
a referendum on leaving the EU, which was then won, despite at the time having no directly elected MPs. Well, they did have a little bit of help in Cyrillic. Let's be clear. Okay. And uh, there is continuity from the early 2000s. The FPO General Secretary, Herbert Kikl, who used to be a speechwriter for Horg Heide, the former FPO leader in 2000, has become the new interior minister. Uh, Heide himself died in a car crash in 2008. I wonder if it was one of those convenient car crashes, like a convenient falling out of a five-story window moving a piano, and you don't own a piano. Could have been one of those convenient heart attacks, but hey. Pierre Moschevici, a socialist EU commissioner, warned that the developments in Austria called for vigilance of Democrats committed to European values. The situation is no different from the precedent of 2000. But the far-right presence in power is never trivial, he said. There's a normalization of these things. There was outrage 17 years ago, and now it's like, eh, I don't know, eh, business as usual. And that is a danger that we need to avoid. In light of the new Austrian government's stance on Russia, Kurtz's meeting with Tusk could be an interesting one, as the former Polish prime minister said explicitly last week. For sure, I am not a fan of Russia. Kurtz says coalition wants to see friendlier relations with Russia. All right-wingers do. And says the EU sanctions are a source of unwelcome tension. Well, of course, there's supposed to be unwelcome tension. Russia invaded another country in, uh, outside of international law. Jesus. Tusk wrote a letter to Kurtz yesterday saying he trusts the Austrian government will continue to play a constructive and pro-European role in the European Union. Now, Austria is the latest country to add to the skeptical chorus within the EU about the effectiveness of Russia's sanctions. Hmm. Kurt said that Austria would continue supporting EU sanctions on Russia imposed over Ukraine, but FPO like other far-right groups in Europe and America, want them lifted. All right, since we're in the general part of the world, why don't we finish up with a little tasty morsel from Greece. Uh, this is by uh, Castelia Madrano out of Newsweek. Underwater archaeologists were surprised to find eight sunken ships from the Roman Empire off the coast of the Greek island of Naxos. The 2,000-year-old shipwrecks were found in depths of less than 100 feet, which is surprising when reporting the find since those waters are crystal clear and a popular tourist attraction. And I've been to Mykonos and Crete. Now, I haven't gone scuba diving, but I have gone snorkeling. And uh, waters in that part of the Mediterranean are just absolutely beautiful. Warm, too. Well, <laughs> if you've been swimming in the Pacific, the Mediterranean feels warm. Archaeologists had been searching Noxos for something else entirely, a harbor once linked to a Byzantine settlement that may once have been the island's capital. Uh, and that was according to the Norwegian Institute at Athens, the entity behind the original survey. To their surprise, a local diver took them to two nearby reefs, one revealing a variety of amphora, or amphora, ancient storage containers, and anchors, and the other containing three shipwrecks. Archaeologist Sven Ahrens, curator of the Oslo Naval Museum and the Norwegian research director of the underwater survey, uh, said that while it's likely that uh, that adds up to four ships, they can't be completely certain. In ancient times, before it became a vacation destination, Naxos was known for high-quality marble exports. During the Byzantine period, according to uh, Hertz, the uh, Israeli newspaper, by the way, the southern harbor of Parnamos became the primary one, and it was that harbor that the researchers had been trying to find when they first arrived. The underwater region off Naxos' southern coast has remained, remained an isolated one, 
meaning it's relatively undisturbed and ideal for this kind of scientific exploration. After finding the first four ships, the researchers continued the work with sonar, upon which they discovered an additional four ships with amphora of their own. Those are the uh, storage vessels, by the way. The vessels would have been loaded with anything profitable enough to justify a long and dangerous sea journey. In addition to passengers, that likely meant goods like olive oil and wine, which would have been the purpose of some of the amphora, as well as armor. Aaron's also told Herrett's that they discovered construction materials like brick and roof tiles, as well as a small stone pallet that they believe was used to blend cosmetics. The relics from the first group of four ships appear to date from the Hellenistic period in the 3rd century BC through the late Roman period up to around 600 AD. The ships from the second group have not been studied yet, but it is possible that molecular analysis of the clay from the amphora could help the researchers pinpoint where they were made. Hertz reported that the team has plans to dive to the wrecks as well as send in remotely operated underwater vehicles in 2018. And they believe other treasures likely await. 2018. That's just around the corner. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, folks, that does bring us to the end of our uh, of our broadcast period for today, and we will be back here tomorrow, of course, for uh, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. That's right. Uh, that has that that has a lot of uh, nuanced meaning, and you can put it any any type of uh, meaning to it as you want. Smothered Benedict Wednesdays tomorrow uh, uh, as a daily special on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And uh, so I, until then, do stay tuned to Netroots Radio 24-7, 365, and we will see you tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. La pluie de novembre, tes mains qui coulent, je n'en peux plus de t'attendre. Les années passent, qu'il est loin, là je tombe. Nul ne peut nous entendre. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère. Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au langue de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Ba da 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 da
Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 